Welcome Bronco Nation to my review of the Boise State versus Wyoming win. Now before I get into the video, before I break down the offense, defense, special teams, go through how Boise State performed against my keys to the game here, uh, I do have a, a, an announcement that's going to be some unfortunate news for most of you. Uh, the mustache is back. <laughs> it has returned. It is, mus it is no shave November. This guy is back in town. It's really unfortunate because I just passed uh, 270 subscribers. I'm sure I'm going to lose about half of them over the next month here and the worst bit is is that I beat my wife in Bowmania last year so for my reward I get to do No Shave November for two months instead of one so I'll be pushing through to December uh, and that is that's a big deal because my wife is like a Bowmania genius she doesn't really watch that much football but she just writes down all the stats goes all math nerd and just predicts the games perfectly I managed to beat her last year so on a roll. Uh, I hope for the sake of all my viewers that I lose this season and don't get to keep the mustache longer next year. Uh, but just wanted I wanted to address the elephant in the room. I know it's kind of hard with the lighting right now, but it is coming and it will get stronger as it goes on. I would like to point out though that since I've started growing this, Boise State is undefeated. So, you know, yeah, I, it could be some good news for the Broncos here coming down the final stretch. Talking about that good news, Boise State is bowl eligible with a win over Wyoming. Finally got the win on the blue, which has been very hard to come this year. Of course, Boise State opened with a win on the blue against UTEP, but then they dropped three games on the blue in a row. The first time that they had done that ever, uh, well, since 1996. The first time since 1996 that they had done that. Uh, of course, that year, Boise State lost five games in a row on the blue, but that was their first season in the FBS. So since their first season in the FBS, they have been strong. They have been uh, explosive. I, I didn't write down the exact stat here, but I think they're 100. With a win today, I think they're 123 and... 13 on the blue uh, since 2000. So Boise State has been dominant at home and it's something that has slipped this season. Honestly, it's been something that's not been 100% the last few seasons and we needed this new coaching staff to come in and establish this new presence at Boise State that I think is going to pay dividends going forward into the future. But of course, a little bit of a rough start there. Two and three start to the season, three losses at home on the blue as part of a part of that, uh, part of, part of all of that. Of course, Boise State had another loss on the blue after that two and three start. But since that two and three start, the last five games, Boise State is four and one, with their only loss being to Air Force in that running. So, and it was a close win and a close loss. And honestly, if it wasn't for the referees, Boise State would have won that game. So, Boise State has shown continued improvement week in and week out. Now, yes, a little bit of a drop off in this game, but the main thing here is Boise State got the win. They still looked a dominant team defensively, especially, which is the biggest key factor here for this Boise defense has, has struggled the last couple of years. Uh, so Boise State looked dominant defensively, and they had their moments offensively. In fact, overall, especially early in this game, Boise State looked pretty dominant offensively. They just couldn't finish the drives. Boise State has one of the best bend but don't break defenses uh, in the country, but unfortunately they also have, on the flip side of that, one of the best bend but don't break offenses. They bend the defense, but they fail to break through most of the time. We'll talk about that here in the, off in the offensive section here in a second. But the main point here is, before I kind of get into these uh, nitty gritties of the win, is that Boise State is on an upward trend, 4-1 and one of the last five games, completely in the hunt here to go and to go to the Mountain West Championship game. If Air Force and Utah State lose tomorrow, which there is a good chance that they will, Air Force not favored by much against Colorado State, and San Jose State favored against Utah State tomorrow. So those are the big games, Bronco Nation. Make sure you're watching those games. Uh, I... I don't have the times that they're on because I forgot to write that down before the video. But uh, I'll put them in the remarks section. You can go in the remarks section of my video and I'll tell you when to watch those games. You need Those are the big ones, all as big as this game for Boise State. Of course, Boise State, if they want to have a chance, they got to keep winning out, but they don't control their destiny right now. So they need Air Force to lose another one. Uh, a couple, couple tough games down the road here for Air Force and Wyoming, uh, Utah State to lose another one here. So... The main point here, though, is that Boise State has corrected their initial struggles. We're starting to see that full potential of what this coaching staff can bring to the table. The mustache is not the only thing that's back. Boise State's running game is back, which is something I didn't think we were going to see at all this season. So there's a lot to be excited about as a Boise State fan. Yes, not the dominant performance that, that we expect out of Boise State at home necessarily, but we got the win, and that's what matters most. And, all, and honestly, this is Wyoming. It's not a rivalry game, but... Craig Ball is an outstanding coach in the Mountain West here. 
yeah, he maybe he doesn't go out and get all the numbers and win as many games as he might have the capabilities to with the players he recruits. But like I said, he's a great recruiter, and he's a great coach, and he's had Boise State's number, only beat them once, but there have been so many close games. Like I said in my preview video, uh, besides one 20-point blowout in the last four games, it's been, uh, pr after that loss, 10-point win by Boise, 3-point win, and an 8-point win. And then, of course, today, a 23-13 to win, so another 10-point win in the series. So Wyoming, not an easy team to play, a good team in the Mountain West, a team that opened up 4-0 to start the season. So a good team with a great freshman quarterback there who is a great talent. So not great yet, but I think he's going to be great. He has that potential. The main point here is, at the end of the day, Boise State, they have four losses. They're not in the running for the top 25. That score spread at the end doesn't matter. What matters most is that Boise State held on this this one. Their defense kept it in there, and their offense managed to pull it out at the end when they needed to, and Boise got the win, and that's what matters. Now, I'm going to critique some things in this video. You know, it wasn't a perfect performance, as I've already mentioned, but... Keep in mind the main thing here, Boise State's bowl eligible for the 24th straight time since 1998. They've been bowl eligible every single year since 1998, so they're bowl eligible. They are doing their part right now to put themselves in the hunt for the Mountain West Championship game. A couple things happen in front of them, but they are right there in contention, and they are 4-1 and one, their last five stretches and undefeated in November since the mustache came back. So those are the important things to remember in this video. Let's get into it. Always kind of six minutes in this intro. I don't like to make my intros that long, but I this, is, this win is big in perspective. It might not seem big by the score point total here, but it's big in total perspective, and I want us to keep that in perspective as we go through this game and, of course, moving into next week, uh, the game against New Mexico. All right, so offense. First off, right off the bat, key players out for Boise State, which I was not tracking, and I, I should have been paying more attention to this. I don't know if there were news reports out of Boise State's pretty close to the chest with their injury report, so it might have been a, a game time announcement or decision. Uh, but Cobbs and Evans both out. Of course, those are big playmakers for Boise State this year, assisting, or not assisting necessarily, but supporting Khalil Shakir, uh, who is that number one receiver for Boise State. But Evans, Great game last week. Of course, that amazing deep catch over the defender. And then Cobbs, only one catch last week, but he has been a big playmaker for Boise State. Very shifty, very elusive, really showing his true capabilities that we saw as glimpses of last season, really showing that in front this year, this game. Well, today, both those playmakers out. So Boise State had to ask a couple. There are other guys who have, have seen some action throughout the season to step up, and I thought they did a good job stepping up for Boise State. Uh, Bowens had four receptions for 36 yards. Billy Bowens there. And he had some nice, he had some nice catches on that, and some, some. First, I think he had two or three first downs uh, on those four catches there. So Bowens did a nice job. Uh, we got to see Capels. Uh, Capels, I think I have difficulty pronouncing his name. We've only seen him a few times here, uh, but Capels, uh, Cho Capels, there we got to see him a few times. Two plays, both for first downs, um, a 15-yard reception and a nine-yard run on a beautiful play call. Honestly, I mean, uh, he doubled. He looked like he was sweeping from left to right, and then he stopped on a dime, came back, took the handoff, and ran for nine yards for first down. Uh, then of course Cutter had a nice game. Two only two catches, 17 yards, and he did look like he got hurt on one of those plays. But he's been a nice playmaker this year stepping in and fulfilling, a, 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 not a key role, but an important role for this Boise State offense. And then most importantly for me here, looking at this Boise State offensive performance as we're looking at the key players here for the passing game, is Riley Smith. Riley Smith finally getting on the same page with Bachmeyer. Yes, only two receptions in this one, but both those receptions were huge. He had a touchdown, his first touchdown of the year. I've talked about in my other videos that Riley Smith should have five or six touchdowns at this point. You know, at least four, but I think five or six touchdowns. One called back on the terrible call by the referees um, in that Air Force game. Or was it Air Force? Yeah, it was Air Force game. Um, so terrible call by the referees, called back a touchdown um, because they stopped the, they called it down to review mid-play. Uh, but that Bachmeyer's actually missed Riley three or four times in the end zone this season as well on overthrown or just uh, high balls that Smith Riley had no chance of going up and getting. And today on a beautiful fake the handoff, roll out to the right, pass to Riley Smith, Finally got that touchdown. So it's great to see the two of them starting to get on the same page because Ryan Smith is a playmaker, former quarterback. He knows the offense. He knows where he, he you know, he's an all-around athlete now playing tight end. So he's got the skills. He's got great hands. Actually had the longest catch of the game for Boise State. So two catches, like I said, both of them big. Touchdown uh, for Boise State here, the only receiving touchdown of the game. And they had a 27-yard reception on that final drive for Boise State, which was the longest receiving play of the game for Boise State. So two big plays by Riley Smith here, and that's just the receiving game. We'll talk about the running game here in a second. Um, actually, we'll talk about it right now. So Boise State, like I said, 
Mustache not the only thing that's back. Boise State's running game is back. George Helani had, and this is going to surprise a lot of people. I'm, I'm wearing, by the way, I'm wearing a Helani jersey today. It's perfect time to do it. So this is going to surprise a lot of people because we all know what a playmaker Helani has been, especially 2019 when he was fully healthy, his freshman season there. And then at times 2020, you know, hampered by injury, of course, but a good game against Utah State. And he kind of came back towards the end of the year, wasn't 100%. Uh, and then he's been in and out this season. But all that long and short, this he had his first ever, first ever, second, so, uh, sorry, first ever, a uh, hundred yard rushing performance back to back. So he had a hundred plus yard rushing performance last week against Fresno State, and he had a hundred yard rushing performance this week against Wyoming. I know I could have worded that better, kind of uh, sold it big, and then then I collapsed on the on on the actual statement. But the main point here is that he has had back to back hundred yard rushing games, which is the first time in his career that he has done that. A lot of huge running games in 2019, but he didn't string them together. Uh, he did get close one game uh, with a 93-yard performance against Florida State, and then he had a 100-yard performance the next week, I think, is uh, is what that stat Yeah, 93 and then 100-yard performance the next game. But he, he not never in his career has he actually strung 200-yard games back-to-back. -back. The fact that he is back performing at this level is a huge huge break for this offense down the stretch coming to, coming here with a chance to play for the Mountain West Championship game and completely turn the storyline of this season around this first season for Andy Avalos. And honestly, I was watching the offensive line and, and yeah, the offensive line has gotten better than what it was at the beginning of the season and there has been improvements. But the main thing here is that it wasn't the offensive line necessarily playing better in this one. Bachmeyer had a little more time than he's had in, the, in past games, but not that much more time. And as far as clearing up holes in the, in, on the run game, running those battles in the line of scrimmage, there were a couple plays, a 38-yarder that, that uh, Holani was able to break out. That was good blocking. But for the most part, Holani was getting harassed in the backfield as much as any other Boise State running back has this season. Uh, or or, to, or near that level, uh, but he's just so elusive, and he's such a he, he somehow manages to combine power. I wouldn't call him a power back, but he somehow manages to combine the power with the speed and the elusiveness to the, where it didn't matter. I mean, there was one play on a first down where he was met by two defenders in the backfield, and he sidestepped both of them and managed to get to the first down. So he averaged over five yards per carry this game, and that wasn't necessarily because of the offensive line. It just it's because when he is 100% healthy, he is. A a difference maker. He is a game changer for this Boise State offense. You think of the great Boise State running backs that have, have been part of this program, of course, kicking it off. Well, I wouldn't say kicking it off because we had great running backs before that, but in this modern era with the Fiesta Bowls and everything, of course, kicking it off with Ian Johnson, uh, and then, of course, you had Jeremy Avery, Doug Martin. Uh, I'm not going to go through and list every single running back. J.H.I. I'm not going to go through and list every single running back that Boise State has had, uh, but Boise State has, ha has been a bit, a bit of a running back you. Uh, and, and while Boise State's had great quarterbacks, it's their running backs that's been able to go and perform and gain starting jobs uh, at the next level. So George Helani is another one of those same caliber running backs. I so hope that he comes back next season. I think he will because he just hasn't been able to put together that performance that will get him where he deserves to be on the draft board. So I so hope that he comes back next season, gets to play one season fully healthy and show the college football world what he brings to the table because Boise State is a completely different team when he is on when he is playing. So he had 102 yards rushing, 20, uh, 20 carries for 102 yards rushing, or also had a reception for seven yards. Uh, no touchdowns this game, just like last game, but a difference maker being out on the field for Boise State. Uh, Tyler Crow, and since we're talking about running backs, might as well mention this. Tyler Crow got a carry. Uh, two carries, actually, on that first drive. Want to see what he can do in the red zone. I liked it. I, I thought that was a really good play by Boise State. He didn't manage to punch it in there, but I did like seeing him. Early. He's a player I've been rooting for all season that has just worked his heart out for this Boise State uh, offense, earning that scholarship from a former walk-on. So, so that was really cool. I just had that writing down. I know I wanted to mention that while I still had it here. Uh, so that was prior to prior to the Riley Smith touchdown. But it, great great to see Boise State using and, and u developing and using all these running backs that they have. But let's talk about those other running backs here while we're at it. Um, Cyrus. Bibalikio, great job today backing up Halani, and I think that's where he shines because when he's able to come in and he's able to be that change of pace running back, we're able to see really what he brings fully to the table, uh, rushed uh, for over 
over 3.8 yards per carry today, 11 carries for 41 yards. He also had three receptions for 18 yards, and that is what he really brings to the table. Halani is a great receiving back, but I think Cyrus is a better receiving back than George. I mean, he, at one play, it was to set up the field goal there towards the end of the first half. He lined up as a wide receiver just outside um, kind of a slot position there, lined up as a wide receiver, and he ran it, ran an inside slant, got the reception, which was a, a pretty hard throw, caught it perfectly in his hands, and was able to run ahead and set up a short field goal, or not a short field goal, but a medium-range field goal for Dalmas, who, of course, knocked it in. And Sorry, that wasn't the medium-range. That was a 47-yarder, that a 43-yarder that he knocked in. But he managed to set him up in makeable field goal range, and, of course, Dalmas kicked it through. We're going to talk about the Iceman here when we get to the special teams unit. But my main point here is that Boise State is finding a way to use all of their playmakers. Uh, now that Halani is back on the field, the other guy... Van Buren, amazing 12-yard rushing touchdown in the red zone. Now that Halani is carrying that bell cow back position, which is where he works out so that it's his best position. Uh, he's the best running back on the team to carry that position for Boise State. Now that Halani is back fully in the role that, that he is best suited for, the other running backs are able to fill into their strengths and highlight those strengths versus having up and down performances uh, and, and not necessarily carrying Boise State the way that Halani does. Halani is able to bring that spark, that next level abilities to the Boise State running game, and he lifts the rest of the running backs up with his performance. And I think we're going to continue to see that the rest of the games out. Uh, I think the way that Boise State is starting to lean into Halani here, the way he is starting to to reach his second win here coming down the final stretch of the season, I think that it is possible that we might see another string of 100-yard rushing games for Boise State, especially against New Mexico, who does not have a good run defense. So that's I wanted to highlight the main positives here, the main positives, which is the playmakers. Before I kind of talk a little bit about some of the struggles here offensively, for Boise State. Um, and so we're kind of going to flow into that one with a little bit of a transitionary topic here, which is Hank Bachmeyer. Uh, so Hank Bachmeyer, not not a struggle for Boise State per se, uh, but 29, uh, sorry, um, 23 of 32 for 225 yards passing, one touchdown, zero interception. Definitely seemed to be pushing the ball more or put, putting into bad situations more than he has the last couple of games when he's kind of started to settle into himself. And I think a big part of that was the fact that he was without two of his main wide receivers. He's basically down as far as receivers that he is familiar with, or that he's used to throwing through, and he's gotten in sync with throughout this season. It was pretty much Kilo Shakir, which we saw Boy State target him a lot this game. Uh, Shakir, eight receptions for 83 yards, and he was targeted a lot more times than that. Uh, deep ball down the side into tight coverage. Two deep balls, actually, into tight coverage on Shakir that he didn't end up being able to come up with both of them. And we're going to talk about that second deep ball into double coverage with pressure on Bachmeyer, about to be hit, releases the ball. It ended up being actually a, a pretty good, beautiful pass uh you know pretty much a perfect pass right into Shakir's hands uh, unfortunately defender ended up smacking Shakir right on the hands as he was about to or right in the chest where the ball was as the uh, as he was about to reel it in but it was a ball that honestly in the situation that Boy State was in should not have been thrown because Shakir Kilo Shakir was double coverage high, double covered high and low and if that pass is not perfect if, if Hank Bachmeyer is in a situation where he has got to score, you know, you're on a final drive and you've got to put those points in and you have time to throw the ball, maybe you make that pass. If there's no one else available, maybe you make that pass. But when you are about to be knocked to the turf, because he saw the guy coming and he knew he had to release, when you are about to be knocked to the turf, so you're already not throwing necessarily uh, off the best platform, and you have a double-covered wide receiver, do not throw that ball because one of two things are going to happen. A, it's going to get intercepted, which it didn't, or B, you are going to expose your wide receiver to getting wrecked when you have two defenders high and low on him, and the second one is what ended up happening with the hit. Uh, Khalil Shakir had to come out for a few plays, so it wasn't a throw that should have been made, and, and we saw Bachmeyer. Boise State not off to a great offensive start, not finishing drives like they needed to. We're going to talk about that in a second. Boise State not finishing drives they needed to maintain that low-scoring affair, that close, within a one-possession game for most of the game here, really until late in the second half. Um, so within one possession, pretty much the entire game, you saw Bachmeyer start to 
fit to start to the game started to speed up for him and he started to stress and started to put the game on himself versus doing what he's done so well which is trust his teammates around him and and, and being able to use all of them to carry boy state to success and i think that's going to be symptomatic or emblematic of the fact well, not, that might not be the right word but the main point is i think that is because of missing those two top wide receivers for him. So he feels like he has to take more of the game onto himself. Even with Halani back, even when the running game improved, he still feels like he has to take more of the plays, on, more of the game onto himself, and it showed today. He also had another play, again under pressure, again forcing it to Shakir, uh, on a play that shouldn't, didn't need to be made. You know, it's, it's third down. Yeah, you want to get that first down, but Shakir in coverage, uh, he had a this time had a, had a, had a defender pretty tight on him, and Bachmeyer is getting hit, releases the ball at in Shakir's direction, overthrows him, almost got picked, went right through the hands of the defender. So it's not something that we've seen out of Bachmeyer the last couple games. It is something we've seen out of Bachmeyer in general. It's something he tends to do, and he's tended to do this season. He's trying to, to push it uh, too much and to try and do too much and and try to. You know, when you're when you're a great quarterback, which I believe Hank Bachmeyer is, you start to almost believe that you can do anything, and that as long as you trust in yourself and you're able to have enough confidence and get that ball out there, special things are going to happen, and that that has happened for Bachmeyer in the past. But he doesn't. You're more likely going to end up in a bad situation when you end up throwing an interception or or hurting one of your players or or or, or just may having a bad you know, intentional grounding or something. You end up having a bad play, and Bachmeyer doesn't need to do that. He has a team that is now stepping up around him. You know, it's not necessarily offensive line, but that uh, that is improving. But not necessarily offensive line that's great. But the running game is back. He has wide receivers who are stepping up, uh, and he has a has a coach, an offensive coordinator, Tim Plow, who is beginning to find himself in this game. So uh, in this season, his initial season here at the Division One level, he's beginning to find himself and settle down into his play calling. So Bachmeyer doesn't need to push it. Boise State's going to have opportunities, live to fight another day, really needs to settle down here. But at the end of the day, no interceptions for Bachmeyer. Lucky on this one. 225 yards passing, so a pretty nice performance. And of course, that one touchdown to Riley Smith definitely had some nice moments for Boise State, which is which I've kind of pointed out here early on, is those nice moments for Boise State with their players offensively. Uh, but overall, consistency not there. And we're going to talk about that right now. So the red zone offense. Red zone offense for Boise State has been terrible all year. Now, when you look at total scoring, total field goals and touchdowns, Boise State is actually seventh in the nation for total scoring. They score, once they get into the red zone, they score 94% of the time. These out of, uh, it's 45 out of 47%, or 44 out of 47 times that they have made it into the end zone, they scored. However, only 26 of those were touchdowns. They have kicked 16 field goals. 16 field goals. That is a insane number of field goals to have to kick inside the red zone. Boise State has only has only scored touchdowns 26 out of the 47 times that they've made it to the end zone, which is good for only 55% of their outings. That's one of the worst in the nation for red zone percentage when you only count the touchdowns. Boise State's only being able to punch it in 55 out of 55%, 26 out of 47 times, 55% overall. And that's what we saw today. Boise State made it into the red zone four separate times. They made it to the Wyoming 9, uh, they made it to the Wyoming 19, they made it again to the Wyoming 9, uh, and then they, they made it to the Wyoming 12. So four separate times, one, two, three, four, four separate times, they made it to the red zone, and only two of those were touchdowns. The other two were field goals. There's your 55% right there. And in fact, it really should have been, if not for Wyoming penalties or a penalty, it really would have been three field goals and one touchdown in the red zone because Boise State was forced to kick a field goal and the uh, Wyoming jumped off sides, clearly jumped off sides, uh, but they weren't called off or forced off. It was just a big, it was a unforced error by Wyoming. Jumped off sides, Boise State got the first down, was able to punch it in for a touchdown. But they got lucky on that. If you look overall at this game, it should have been uh, Boise State winning if you take off the four points here. So it should have been Wyoming 13, uh, Boise State 19. <laughs> so very much closer game than it ended up being if Boise State doesn't get lucky with that field and only ends up scoring one touchdown in this game. Uh, ends up kicking four field goals and only one touchdown. So, and, and that wasn't the only time that Boise State actually made it into Wyoming's side of the field two other times 
and it was forced uh, field goal and a turnover down on down. So it's not just red zone. I mean, it's, it's Wyoming getting into the opponent's field overall. Of course, red zone is what ends up getting tracked. That's what statistically shows. But it's, it's worse than that if you start looking at when Boy State gets inside their opponent's 40 onward. I mean, that 55% drops down significantly uh, somewhere in the 40% range uh, or less. So Boise State has really, really struggled this year to end to fit, close out drives. And again, I think that is emblematic. I think I used the word correctly that time of a young coaching staff adapting to this level of play and adapting to the playmakers. The same things. I, mean, I could probably just make a tape recorder here and put it of the things that I've said every single video basically is Young coaching staff adapting to their players, uh, not Tim Plow's off players that he's recruiting to his offense, trying to merge his offense into the players that he's used to. The players getting used to him. You've heard it all before. I'm not going to rehash it. Uh, but but we're you know that's what's happened up happening here. And, and uh, Tim Plow's a smart enough guy that eventually he's going to figure it out about how what he, that needs to happen for Boise State to finish in the red zone. And honestly, I think it starts bringing in. Uh, some creative packages here. Maybe bring in one of your mobile quarterbacks who are able to throw and run the ball to maybe force the defense to cover something different there. Maybe you go with some of the wildcat, wildcat formats. Maybe you go like the touchdown to Riley Smith with some more RPO type looks or, or some faking the, using the run game that you've been drawing the, the defense in all game Fake that run and, and throw the outside pass. Use your tight ends more effectively. I mean, I'm not going to tell. Obviously, I, I am not qualified to tell Tim Plow how to do his job, and, and he knows what he's doing. But Boise State needs to find a way to fix these red zone deficiencies because while they're scoring, and that's great, it's great to have that safety net there of Dalmas at the kicking position, able to get points if Boise State doesn't punch the ball in. You're going to get into a lot of positions here, and Boise State's kind of already seen it this season. With a lot of these close losses, you're going to get into positions in these games, especially I'm looking at that San Diego State game, I'm looking at a potential Mountain West Championship game, where points, period, are not enough. You need those touchdowns to win those games. If you can't score touchdowns in the red zone, you, usually you're not going to win most of a lot of your football games you're going to end or you're going to end up dropping key games against key opponents so boise state has got to figure this out they've got a couple more games here down the stretch and they need to figure out this week they need to figure it out this week they need to figure it out against new mexico and come in strong against san diego state if they get that opportunity in the mountain West championship game they need to figure it they need to have figured it out prior to that for sure but that san diego state game is going to be very very tough and while New Mexico is probably a weak enough opponent, not one they should overlook, but a weak enough opponent that Boise State can get away with some deficiency, deficiencies offensively and not finishing drives, San Diego State is not going to be that forgiving. Boise State needs to figure out a way to fix this if they want to be a team that doesn't just stick around in this competition, in this conversation for Mountain West Championship game, but is able to go out and get it in Andy Galvalos' first year head coaching for Boise State. All right, so... I don't know if I assigned it at the beginning here, but the grade overall for the offense is B+. I think I've spoken pretty clearly to why that is. Uh, so overall, I thought it was a good effort by Boise State in this one. Driving between the 20s, getting into the into the position, but that inability to finish in the red zone is a real drawback for a Boise State offense that otherwise has a lot of potential. And we're gonna and I'm, I'll talk about it in my keys to the game here at the end. I wanted to kind of save that, uh, but we're gonna talk about how that running game, the emphasis on the running game, kind of impacted offense here. Uh, but the main point here, B plus overall for the offense, definitely moving in a better direction than they were at the beginning of the season, but still trying to figure some things out. All right, defense overall. All right, we're already at 28 minutes. Man, I did not mean for this video to be this long. But, so I will try to go quickly through the defense and special teams. At some point, I'm going to have to flip the video and do defense first so I can spend a lot of time on defense. I always end up talking forever about the offense and have to blow through the other two bits. All right, anyhow, defense a performance on, on defense. Outstanding job by the defense. Was it as showy as some of Boise State's other performances? You know, multiple turnovers, tackles for lost sacks here and there. No, it wasn't. Uh, but it and was it consistent throughout? No, Boise State gave up two 70-plus yard touchdown drives. But overall, it was another solid performance by the Boise State defense. They started out hot and they finished strong until that last drive. But they finished strong and they kept the Boise State offense in the game, they kept Boise State in this game the entire time and and held Wyoming, who has been a pretty dangerous uh, team, especially in the running game, held them to under 132 yards rushing. I mean, this is a Wyoming rushing team that averages over 192 rushing yards per game. Boise State held them to 132 rushing yards overall. And 
59 of those rushing yards came on one drive. So if you don't count that one drive, Boise State held Wyoming to 73 yards rushing today. That is an amazing number for a Boise State. I don't know how this happens. For a Boise State defense, it's miraculous. A Boise State defense that started the season being one of the worst run defense teams in the country. I mean, they were getting run over by everybody. I mean, even UTEP was able to find some holes against them early. Boise State has flipped the script here down the final stretch of the season against good te- against good running teams. I mean, Fresno State is not a bad running team at all. They are a good running team. They average over 150 yards per game. Uh, Wyoming, almost 200 yards per game rushing. Colorado State, not their number one uh, offense, but a good rushing team in Colorado State. And they held all of them to below their season numbers, well below their season numbers. And besides a few big you know, drives or a few big plays, overall, they looked d- dominant in the trenches, winning the battles in the trenches. Some of the defensive line, uh, the defensive line at the beginning of the year was as weak as the offensive line. Definitely those two units were the weakest parts of this Boise State team. And somehow, I don't know, I don't, it's, it's mostly the same players. So it's just through coaching adjustments to how the plays are being called and, and how, how, you're, how they're doing things in practice. Boise State has flipped the script defensively and turned their, their run defense, their defensive line, their linebackers, into one of the key strengths of this team. And it is incredible to watch. Boise State, they, they, people questioned bringing in a defensive coach. Boise State had never done it before as a head coach. Boise State had never brought in a defensive-minded head coach. I mean, you look across college football, there's not a lot of defensive-minded head coaches. I, I can't think of any off the top of my head right now that were defensive coordinators that are succeeding as offense, as head coaches right now. But I, I, I said... At the beginning of the season, of course, every Boise State fan's dream is to get Kellen Moore to come back here. And so I was upfront with that, that Kellen Moore was my dream head coach for Boise State. But I said, if we don't get Kellen Moore, which, you know, ended up not happening, but if we don't get Kellen Moore, Andy Avalos is the best guy for this team. Because, honestly, his skill set is what Boise State needed most to, that, that was the weakest part of Boise, State's, uh, Boise State over the last few seasons. Over the last five, ten seasons, really... Post the 2014-2015 season, you know, the 2016-2017 defenses had some highlights. But, you know, post, besides from those seasons, Boise State's defense has been on a downward trend really overall. And especially last season and, and 2019, especially both those two years, defenses were not playing at the normal Boise State defensive levels. And and Boise State teams of the, of, of, you know, the, of the uh, Chris Peterson era those Boise State, uh, you know, Kellamore eras that went out and were in the top fives, they were there not not only because of their great offenses, but because they had dominant defenses. Dominant defenses. You build a team on your defense. Offense is what gets all the attention, which brings all the splash, all the glory. But your defense is where you are able to establish yourself as a consistent team that is going to win football games week in and week out. And Boy and Andy Avalos and his staff here have done. The, one of the most amazing jobs, one of the most amazing resurrections of a defense that I have ever seen to take a Boise State defense that was a true liability at the beginning of the season and turn them into not just a big play turnover machine, which we saw that impact right away, but it turned them from not just a big play turnover defense, but to a consistent defense with a big play element. That is incredible, and that is why Boise State fans should have an amazing sense of hope for this Boise State team going into the next few seasons here and and beyond, as long as Andy Avalos is with us, because he is taking a team that honestly, when you looked at them on paper, statistically, this was not one of the elite, great Boise State rosters, especially defensively. It wasn't, and he has taken that team and turned them into a premier level defense for this Boise State team. It's amazing. And if he can do that with the players that were already on this roster, and nothing against the players that were already on this roster, I think part of it was just maybe not a lack of, of recruiting, uh, not recruiting, sorry, lack of, of coaching and emphasis. But if he can take what, what on paper was not a great defense at the beginning of the season, if he can take that, what is his limit with players that he is recruiting and bringing in and attracting with his head coaching ability that are actually coming in as, as elite-level prospects 
and, and that he is building that fit perfectly into his system, that he's not using someone else's players. What is his ceiling? I, I don't think there is one. I mean, it is incredible looking at what Boise State has been able to do this season defensively from what the beginning of the year to the, to the end of the year. And that is why I think I, I was calling three seasons in. So so not this season, but next season. Sorry, not, not next season, but the season after that. So 2023. I was calling 2023 as the year that Boise State would be back. But if Boise State keeps trending the way that they are, and they're able to keep a hold of a couple of key players. You know the ones I'm talking about. If Boise State is able to keep trending the way that they are and keep a hold of those key players going into the next season, they might be back next year. Boise State's got, though, the, obviously, they have to keep moving forward. They have to keep progressing. They can't rest on their laurels. They, and their defense needs to continue to stay dominant. But if they can, this is an amazing future that Boise State is looking ahead into, and I am incredibly excited for it. So let's talk about specifically about what the defense did today. Like I said, uh, 288 yards overall, only allowed 156 yards passing, 74 of which came on one play at the end of the game when it didn't really matter. So, uh, well, um, you know, not say it didn't really matter, but it didn't make an impact on the game. So 74 yards in one play. So really, they held them to 82 yards passing, and then 132 yards rushing. And like I said, 59 of that on one drive. Other than that, 73 yards rushing other than that one drive. In fact, out of the 10 drives, Wyoming had four of them had 10 were 10 yards or less. One of them was 10 yards and the rest were five yards or less. Boise State actually had one that was a negative one yard, a three and out negative one yard drive by Wyoming. Um, and of the 150, so we talked about the big pass play and then the big run uh, drive. So when you look at the statistics overall, out of those 288 yards, 151 of them came on those two drives. The big one running drive with a touchdown, where, boys, where Wyoming kind of just pushed down the field for 73 yards and a touchdown. And then the second one, that 74-yard pass. If you take both those out, Wyoming only has 151 yards, uh, sorry, 137 yards of offense. So 52% of their offense came on two drives. This was an amazing Boise State performance. Now, now, statistically, when you when you look at individual performances, when you look at the uh, the, the big highlight numbers, the turnovers, the sacks, the tackles lost, was it an amazing? You know, was it a, a, a light up the scoreboard type performance? No. You know, one one interception. By the way, Washington's first interception uh, of his career. So one interception, two tackles for loss, and one sack. So when you look at just that that very microscopic view. You know, not a dominant performance. But you look at these statistics overall, a dominant performance. Uh, two hurries in that, and I was counting the the, the amount of plays that Boise State was actually breaking through the, the offensive line and putting pressure on the quarterback. Maybe not counting as a hurry or counting as a sack, but, amount, but Boise State had at least seven if not more plays, that they put extensive pressure on the quarterback. Boise State used to go whole games where they might have like three sacks, and that was the only three times that they actually put any pressure on the quarterback. In fact, until really that last quarter there, really until the last quarter, Williams had no time to pass the ball. I mean, he was under pressure every single play. Now, Boise State did need did, did have a little bit of a breakdown in stopping the quarterback run game. So they put pressure on him and he stopped the pass and then he'd break out of there because he's six foot five and a good runner. He'd break out of there and he'd run for some yards. I mean, he had 38 yards rushing on 11, on 11 carries today. So, so he was able to get out and make some plays with his legs. But so the main point is he wasn't throwing the ball down the field. Boise State was keeping everything in front of them and forcing the, deep, the, forcing the offense to beat them on the ground, which... Except for one drive, they were unable to in this game. An amazing performance overall by the defense. Uh, I want to just really overview here and see if there's any other important notes. Um, key player performances. Jones had some massive hits. Uh, he, I think he is looking at some of this attention that's going to Skinner and saying, hey, I deserve a little bit of that too. And he is make, And today, I, I, he had bigger hits than Skinner did today. Um, not that Skinner was you know a wuss <laughs> obviously not uh, Skinner was a again just a, a pile driver you know as he always is one of the biggest hitters on the team so obviously not saying that but 
I think Jones wins the hard hat captain of the game uh, or hard hat performance of the game with his massive hits. Uh, I mean, he had one hit where he could knock the wind out of the Wyoming quarterback after, after a long run, but he stopped the he stopped it from being longer than it would have been. Not, he had to come out for like three plays. And then he had another play where he just absolutely leveled Swen um, to again stop a long play. It was a four first down, but he just came out of nowhere and just demolished Swen. So, and of course, Skinner had some big hits as well. Um, hampered a little bit late in the game with that hand injury, but still hitting as hard as he always did. But the Jones and Skinner are definitely Rise, Jones is definitely rising on the charts here to be equal to, in my opinion, in, in, in a lot of senses, um, to Skinner's performances as far as the big hits. Even though he doesn't have the same stature, he is playing with just much energy. But so is all these. That's the whole point. All of these Boise State defenders are doing that. All of them are bringing not just 100%, not just 110%, but 200% energy on every single play. And, and that's why you look at it and they, they don't have all, all the big, you know, individual performances numbered. I mean, Wimpy had a nice game, he had eight tackles, but, you know, one sack here and, and one interception and, and two tackles were lost. But, but when you look at that and not, not a large number of individual highlight performances, but you look at a team overall that only allowed 288 yards and really only 137 yards if you don't count two drives. What that speaks to me is a team defense concept that every single person is covering their assignments, playing with aggression, and stopping their man on every single play. And it's something that, honestly, Boise State has missed for a long time. You know, Boise State started having this rise where it was always one guy. You know, one great defender, but really one guy that the whole defense kind of funneled through. I mean, I'm thinking of Demarcus Lawrence. I'm thinking of Leighton Vander Esch. I'm thinking of Curtis Weaver. Uh, you know, I, Boise State always had this one great guy and usually ended up getting drafted in the first or second round. This one great defender that the defense kind of relied upon. But this is not that kind of defense. And the great defenses of Boise State Pass weren't those kind of defenses. They had defenses where every single player was playing to the same level of equal of importance and making the same level of impact where you couldn't even highlight on any one guy. And yeah, most of those guys would end up going and doing great things at the next level. It wasn't that Boise State was lacking those key players, but it's that everyone was stepping up. And that's what we're seeing out of this Boise State defense. That ability to show that team leadership concept to say we are going to establish and set the tone for the game. That's what we're seeing here in the second half of the season overall. And that's what we saw in this game, besides, of course, those two plays. Let's talk about those two plays real quick here. Um, all those two drives. Yeah, run breakdown on that uh, on that. That one drive, that first touchdown drive, um, 17 passing yards, 59 yards through the ground. They really pounded it out. But again, that's been a great thing that Boise State's been able to do, especially second half where they started bringing that second half performance into the first half. Those corrections looking, hey, what's going wrong? Let's make those corrections right now. Boise State's the last three games has been showing that ability to make those corrections quickly and shut down any offensive momentum. And then... Last play, basically last play of the game here for Wyoming, besides the missed point, point after attempt. Um, so last play of the game. It wasn't a long throw. It was like a 15-yard completion. Defender doesn't break down like he's supposed to. Wide receiver runs right around him. Uh, safeties are caught out of position. Wide receiver basically just sprints past four guys for a touchdown. So not you know not the way that Boise State wanted to end things. Also not the way they wanted to end things offensively. Hank Bachmeyer takes a sack there in the red zone uh, to force a field goal attempt on the play after that. Uh, but takes a sack on in the red zone when he was at the Wyoming nine. Takes a sack, ends up short pass forced field goal and then defensively ends it on a big touchdown loss. so it's not the way you want to end those games for sure Boise State definitely wants to finish stronger and play the same amount of, of passion and fire that they showed the whole performance but besides those plays it was a great performance overall and while it might not be the way that Boise State wanted to end it they played the whole game absolutely the way that you want to play a performance and I hope that that last perform that last play doesn't weigh on their minds it doesn't slow their momentum if anything it just inspires them to come out and be even more dominant next week which if they're able to do that is going to be a very very scary performance for those Lobos coming uh uh, Boy State's end up facing next week all right so uh defense there a B, offense B plus special teams um a minus a minus overall, uh, so a good A performance here, A minus here performance here by the special teams. Uh, first off, the guy that gets an A plus is Dalmez. 
he has, I said in the last video that I thought he was the best Boise State kicker that we've ever seen, and he continues to prove that week in and week out. And, and today, when Craig Bowl calls three timeouts in a row, there towards the end of the half, and I've never understood that strategy. I understand icing the kicker with your first two timeouts. I understand that. But why would you call your third timeout? It doesn't do anything. You've already messed with whatever you're going to do, if that even does anything, which I think it does, but you know, some people debate that. Whatever. You've already done what you wanted to do with his headspace on those first two timeouts, give him extra time to think about it. The third timeout... All it does is it takes all the pressure off of him because he knows that he's going to be, he knows at that point that he's going to be able to go and kick the field goal, that it's going to count because he knows you don't have a timeout left. He knows that he can take as much time as he wants to, and he's going to be able to line up, go and kick it through the uprights. If you don't call that last timeout, you hold on to that. The kicker doesn't know if you're going to call it or not. And maybe he's kind of side glancing you a little bit off on the sidelines going, hey, is this going to count? Are you going to call that timeout or not? He's, 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 that, he's playing that head game. That's what you want to do. You know, they say kickers are head cases. You want to get into that head and start kicking it around a little bit uh, so they don't end up kicking you around with a good field goal kick. So I don't understand that concept of calling three timeouts in a row. And the, the crowd gave him what for when he did a uh, big boo on that third timeout, which was well-deserved. But Dalmez you, why try to ice the ice, man? You can't ice that which has ice in its veins because Dolmez goes and knocks down a long or a mid-range long kick here when it counted, absolutely when Boy State needed to finish the half uh, on a strong point that they were able to ride that momentum into the second half and end up winning this game. Three out of three, long of 43. An amazing performance again by Dolmez. I've talked about it last game, but what, I don't, I cannot begin to explain for any anyone who's a newer Boise State fan you talk to some of the talk to some of the guys that have been around for a while because I we cannot explain what a relief it is to be able to sit back and know that, that field goal's going through on you know 96% or whatever Dama's his percentage is this season I think it's like 94% he's missed like I, I talked about it last game I'm not gonna rehash that right now but uh you know whatever it is he, he's, he's barely missed any field goals I think he's missed like like one or two field goals this season. Um, whatever it is, you know that field goal is going through 90 plus percent of the time. And that is not something that Boise State fans have had in a long time here. Uh, and it's great to be able to see that with two back-to-back -back great kickers in the last uh, few seasons here. Um, so A- minus overall. Uh, the A- minus kind of comes a bit from the return game. No returns. No returns from the punting team or the return team. No you know, fumbles or big mistakes, but no returns overall. Uh, the coverage was a little iffy today. Uh, Vasquez actually had to make the tackle on the play right after... I think it was the first Boise State touchdown. He, you never want to, you never want to see your kicker having to make a tackle for two reasons. A, that's when kickers usually get hurt is making tackles, and you don't usually have great backups for your primary kickers in a position that you build deep because they're not supposed to be getting hurt. So that's something you don't want to see. And B, it also means that if your kicker's having to make a tackle, that you really messed up coverage-wise. So don't want to be able to have to see that. Great that Vasquez was able to go down and make the tackle and stay on him. I um, mean, I, I played special teams for a bit in high... or Actually, I played special every special teams unit in high school. And I know it's not easy to be on those coverage teams. So great job by Vasquez being able to go down and make that tackle. Uh, but that's not something you want to see. And then the Boise State, very lucky. Uh, on one of the Wyoming punts not to get called for a roughing the kicker probably maybe should have been Boy State defender came diving in low never ever ever want to see a coverage guy coming diving in low if you're going to dive dive high try to block that kick never dive low and he, he dived at the punter versus at where the kick was going so he dived right at the punter ended up kind of going underneath his legs uh, maybe the punter sold it a little bit but he definitely hit him um, or, or it looked like he hit him, but the refs didn't end up calling a flag on that play. So, but Boy State, the main point here, Boy State lucky they didn't get a flag on that. They need to clean up a little things here, a little bit, a few things here, there in the punt and return coverage. I think I re retracts from a little bit of an A-plus rating that they would have gotten overall with Domus's performance. Um, and then, and Vasquez, you know, nice performance overall, nothing catastrophic, no uh, terrible punts. He was mostly punting from short range today, so only a long of 45, uh, four punts, uh, average of 41.3. So, the average is not as large as it usually is when he has a great day, but it was mostly because he was punting 
uh, from you know shorter range. He could have, he could have, he did have room to work with. He could have pushed on those punts further back inside of the twenty. I think he only had one down inside the twenty today, so he definitely had some room to work with there. So not a, not an A plus performance, but not a bad performance by Vasquez here. So A minus performance over here by the special team. So this is already one of my longer videos, and I didn't mean it to be. I thought it was gonna be one of my shorter ones, but. Oh, well, here we are. Going to run through here real quick the final three keys that uh, how Boise State performed against my three keys of the game. We'll be done and ready for that, uh, ready for a full set of games. Probably today for most of you watching this. So a full set of games today. Boise State has some big ones here. Like I said, that Colorado State versus Air Force matchup and that Utah State versus San Jose State one. All right, and then of course at the end of the end of end of Saturday's big game, San Diego State versus Nevada could be determining who we play or or, or leaning in who who we're going to be playing in that Mountain West Championship game. So that's going to be a big one to, if we get to not it, no, nothing assumed. If we get the Mountain West, whoever the Mountain Division uh, winner faces, they, that game might decide who they end up facing in that one. All right, so here first one. Don't be sucked into the running back run game. This will be the longest key that I end up talking about. And I'm going to go breeze through the last two here. Don't be sucked into the running back run game. And uh, F on that one. Absolutely an F. And what I'm talking about here is that Boise, I knew it was coming. I saw it coming from miles away. I talked about it in my preview of the video that Boise State established the run game last week. They have a running back. He's showing that ability to be explosive and to be the running back that Boise State's needed all season. And I just knew, I just knew that Tim Plow with, you know, new, newer to this Division One FBS level offensive coaching. So he's been an offensive coordinator for a while, but it's completely different at this level. So he's really, he's a new offensive coordinator at this level. I just knew that he would be sucked in by that running game and say, wow, we can emphasize the running game now. Let's push into it. Not what Boise State needed to do in this one because it really killed their offense overall. By doing that, you do two things. First off, you assume a lot that you're going to be able to run the ball successfully on a consistent basis, which you haven't proven all year. You've had some, some improvements, and you had a good game against Fresno State, but you've not been able to do that all year. So you're risking a lot. Secondly, it takes your offense that has been working together and building a flow and getting on the same page. And we started seeing that Boise State offense heating up. Big, big plays against Fresno State because the offense was finally getting on the same page. Bachmeyer and, and the rest of this offense, like I said, getting on the same page, getting in sync together, and finally getting into the same mindset. You take that and you throw it all away to try and introduce a new run-based concept that has no proven basis and that you're throwing away all of that consistency that you've developed with the other offensive scheme. If it's the beginning of the season, you want to try something new, maybe. But this late in the season, you want to go with what has been start working, you know, and, and start perfect that and build on that. I'm not necessarily that it's worked every game, but it's shown flashes in the time that it, it hasn't worked is when Boise State's had tried to go away from it, become too um, too uh, conservative and too focused on the run games, really when it's killed that creative pass-focused offense that Tim Plow brings to the table. So Boise State needed to lean heavier into that and not in the run game. Use your running backs. Use George Helani, who's showing his abilities again. Use him in that offense because he has a key role in that offense. The running game helps set up the passing game, and the backs are key weapons in that passing attack. But don't try to become a run-based attack. At one point there, late in the third, Boy State had rushed the ball 25 times, passed the ball 22 times, trying to go to a, a balanced approach, uh, and, and had been really emphasizing the run game earlier on. They kind of picked up the pass games late, but it really and earlier on in the game it was even more of a swing. Uh, and, and what we saw out of that was the Wyoming defense creeping closer and closer and closer to the line of scrimmage, and the longer the game went on, the less efficient and effective those, that, that running game became. Boise State. Um, we also saw a, redu a reduced potency in the passing game. I think, you know, obviously part of that was the fact that, that Bachmeyer was without, was without two of his top wide receivers. But also another part of that is that he's not able to get into the same flow. And the new guys that are out there, he's not able to get into rhythm with those guys because he's not throwing off that many passes. Like I said, you know, Cutter had two receptions or two passes thrown to him uh, or two receptions there. Bowen's four and, and Capel's one or Capel's one there. So, Bachmeyer not able to start to establish the, that bond and get on the same page with his wide receivers. Uh, and we saw when Boise State started trying to push the ball deep in the late in the second half. 
very ineffective in that because Boise State, he hadn't had time to get in flow with his playmakers all day. And actually, it was hurting Boise State's drives. Uh, Boise State putting together uh, a good some good drives here late, uh, or not late, but throughout this game, uh, gets into the red zone or starts pushing into New Mexico's territory. I mean, the key one, the, the one that was most emphasized this was the first, the first drive of the second half. Boise State... Very, very creative in the run game, getting the wide receivers involved in the sweeps, um, using the normal run game as usual, which also helps, throwing to the middle of the field, attempting the deep ball, getting all of their offense in, the normal Templar offense that we've seen, and then they ran it up the middle three times in a row. Uh, Cyrus up the middle three straight times, didn't get barely anywhere, uh, and had to force a field goal. Killed the entire drive. Because they tried to, they got sucked in again to trying to establish the run game. This is not the time to try and go out and just establish the run game, especially against a team that is a good team here in Wyoming. Uh, and you're trying to snap a three-game losing streak at home. This is not the time to go out and try to establish the run game. The main reason that Boise State didn't put up the 41 points that I predicted them that they that predicted that they could is that they didn't play like they did against Fresno State. They didn't come out and play aggressively. They weren't playing up tempo on offense. They weren't utilizing the full playbook that Tim Plow has at his ability at, at his uh has it has available to him because they were trying to focus and emphasize on this run game. The run game sucked a lot of the creativity. It sucked a lot of the tempo. It sucked a lot of the innovation out of the play calling to try and establish this running game, which Boise State had some success in, but it wasn't consistent throughout. And the passing game, on the other hand, was affected by that as well. So F overall for don't be sucked in the run game. I hope that Boise State learned their lesson in this one. They need to continue to emphasize what's worked. What had, what really, I mean, obviously Boise State hasn't had the best record all season, but that offense, when it is being run as Tim Plow is capable of running it, and he's not shooting himself in the foot by taking the pedal off the gas too soon or, or trying to mix in playmakers like last week when Boise State mixed in green for a drive, for an entire drive, or it's just one play for an entire drive, killed that drive. And when you're not trying to mix in, in, in playmakers in, in the wrong situations and, and you're not trying to, to kill yourself by going too conservative uh, or, or focus on the run game after a, a, some, a good series of up-tempo passing attacks and you try to you know, kill the whole drive by going to the run game multiple plays in a row, when he's not doing that, Boise State's offense has been extremely dangerous and very, very efficient offensively. I mean, what we saw out of that last drive for Boise State was perfect until the sack. It was perfect. Boise State was using the running play. They were they were setting up the pass with that. They were sucking the defenders up. And then they threw a 20-plus yard pass to the tight end, Riley Smith. And then they had another beautiful suck the run game, suck the defense up in the run game, and then roll out pass to Kilo Shakir. Of course, ended up getting sacked. But that's going to happen. You know, you're, you're going to have that. That's going to impact your playmaking throughout the entire game. That's going to happen. But it's not going to happen every single drive. And the more times that you are consistently getting involved in the offense that you know that you're able to run, that you have shown the ability to be explosive in, the more times you're going to have more success. The more likely you are to have success in the long term and put up those big point numbers. The mo like I said, most important thing in this one, Boise State got the win. However... That might not have been the case if Boise State was playing a little bit of a better opponent like they will be in San Diego State. They need to make sure that they are continuing to use what has worked, use their playmakers, which is their passing game this year, and start to put into, into that offense the key playmakers that are now stepping up. Keeley here in uh, George Lani. It's a completely, de completely different team when George Lani's out there. But just use him like you were using the running backs previously, and you're going to have more success in that running game, which is going to set up success in the passing game, which is going to, in turn, set up success in the running game because the defenders are going to have to be backing out to cover the pass, and then you can get the running game going, which is going to suck the players up in the running game. It's going to just bounce his back, reverberates all game long. And Boise State can continue to do that if they keep running the same offense. There's no reason to change now just because you have a great running back back. All that does is it makes the offense you're already running more explosive and more dangerous, and that's what Boise State needs to keep doing this season. All right, so second key here, prevent the big play over the top, A+. Plus. Um, Boise State, mostly because of that great pass rush that they had going, uh, but also because of some great defensive plays. Biggers especially stopped a long pass um, on a third and 10, was perfect, in perfect position. The, the player even tried to catch the ball around him, but he was in the way, and he didn't 
commit any kind of pass interference on the play. It was a perfect, just shadow the defender all the way down, was right there in his grill without making contact, got his head around so he's an equal participant going for that ball and knocked it away. Perfect play there. The only long play that uh, that Wyoming had, the only long pass that they were able to get off all game was that 74-yarder, but it was actually a short pass that turned into a long one. Main point here is that Boise State did not allow any deep balls at the top. A few times it looked like at Wyoming was looking for it, but there was no time for Williams to pass, and the defense was tight, so they were unable to get that ball off. A-plus performance on prevent the big plays at the top. Emphasize the deep ball, C-plus. Uh, in the first half, there were no plays, no passing plays of 20-plus yards. Even on, there was one attempt for one in the final drive to Khalil Shakir, but no passing plays for over 20 yards. Um, in the second half, Boise State had four attempts for plays of 20-plus yards, and but because the wide receivers weren't on the same key for a variety of reasons, A, new guys that Bachmeyer is adapting to, and also Boise State hadn't set up that ability to be on the same page by getting Bachmeyer into rhythm, throwing to these guys early on, so a combination of reasons. Boise State only completed one of those plays, like I said, it was the one to Riley Smith. Only ended up, even after, even after last week, when Tim Plow came out and said that he wanted to emphasize the long passing game and build it into the offense, Boise State didn't go to it except for five times in the entire game. Only, only ended up completing one of those. So Boise State, again, I want to say lucky to get off here with this one of the win. Defense was dominant, and that kept him in it. And the offense had plenty of opportunities, and and right and, uh, and Dahm was able to get his leg involved to get that win for Boise State. So not lucky to get out of here with a win. Boise State looked like the better team and was able to win this one, but not performing necessarily to the capabilities that they have shown this season uh, or obviously what this coaching staff is able to put forth. So overall here, um, great I, overall got the win that's the most important good performance by Boise State overall especially on defense some things to clean up here moving forward expecting a great performance next week against New Mexico as Boise State hopefully rolls through don't overlook can't overlook anybody but rolls through cleans some things up fixes some of these items gets things set up perfectly to run into that San Diego State game which hopefully depending on how some things run out this weekend hopefully it has a lot on the line moving into December. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you like and subscribe. And as always, go big blue.